Okay, um, let's uh, let's pray, and then we'll get started, right? Let's pray. And as we are as we are praying, um, you know, we we studied that the Holy Spirit is the one who is our teacher, so we can pray asking the Holy Spirit, Lord, you teach us, right? Teach me today. Um, the Holy Spirit is the comforter, so we can ask. We can ask for comfort, his comfort, you know, wherever we need his comfort. The Holy Spirit is also the one who convicts us. So maybe you know, we, we are restless, we are just troubled about something. And uh, we can ask the Holy Spirit to convict us. Lord, show us, convict us, teach us. Where is it that we need to change? Right? The Holy Spirit um, is the one who leads us into all truth, who guides us. So we can ask, Lord, you guide me. You guide me into everything that is of truth, um, everything that is a lie, everything that is a deception. Uh, let it be broken. Let it be removed from my life. Okay, so we can we can ask the Holy Spirit. But all of these things, or maybe there's something that's in your heart, you know, uh, in in these things that we mentioned, right? So we can ask the Holy Spirit to to lead us into all truth, to comfort us, to convict us. And uh, we can ask the Holy Spirit to teach us, right? Let's do that. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. Thank you. I just want everybody to pray, right? Open your mouths and just pray. If you want to pray in the Spirit, if you want to pray in tongues, you can do that. Uh, or just pray in your own language. Yes, God. Yes, Lord. Father, we thank you, the Lord, that um, the Holy Spirit, that you are the... You are the one who is the teacher. Lord, teach us, Lord. Enable us to be surrendered, yielded, Lord, even as you teach us. Lord, you are the comforter. Lord, comfort us today. Lord, for those of us who are grieving, those of us who are troubled, Lord, those of us who are feeling a weight of sadness, Lord, in our emotions, Lord, I pray that, um, yeah, you would comfort with your presence, strengthen, Lord, with your presence, Lord. Lord, we pray that you would guide us into all truth. Anything that is a lie of the enemy, let it stand exposed right now. You know, and I expect God to show you, you know, what is the lie that we are believing? You know, a lie causes fear. A lie traps us. Uh, it, it always imprisons us. A lie does not release us into all that God wants us to do. So uh, a lie is, 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 a, is a work of the enemy. No, he's called the father of lies. But the Holy Spirit comes to liberate us. So even as he leads us into truth, he will show us if there are any lies that we are believing. You know, lies could be something you know, about the future that we will, we, will not be, we will not be able to accomplish anything. That's a lie from the enemy. That we will be worthless. That's a lie from the enemy. That we will never be free of certain things. Like addictions, maybe, you know, that's another lie from the enemy, right? Maybe the, there is so much of fear, fear of failure, fear of man, fear of future, you know, that those things are caused by the lies of the enemy. So, uh, even as the Holy Spirit exposes these things, right? May the Holy Spirit remove this with the truth. May the Holy Spirit present us with the truth. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father. We receive, Lord. We receive the truth, Lord. We thank you that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And so we receive the truth that you bring us, Lord. May your truth be enthroned in our hearts, Lord. Lord, may every lie be dethroned, God, removed, Lord, from our hearts. We thank you. We bless your name. We give you all the praise and all the glory at this time. In Jesus' matchless name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. So, um, we studied about, I think we completed the book of Acts, right? We went through the book of Acts. We looked at the work of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, right? Uh, in the church, uh, in the book of Acts. Um, so, very exciting. We saw how the church was born. We saw how the Holy Spirit was poured out, how people were anointed, right? And we saw in different ways, right? From that time when the disciples were baptized in the Holy Spirit, we saw that the others also were baptized in the Holy Spirit, right? We also saw that, well, the Holy Spirit 
dwells in us as we become believers, but we also saw that the Lord Jesus wants to lead us into a, an experience, into a, you know something called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, so that we are empowered, right? So that we are clothed with power to be witnesses, right? That's the will of God, and that is also something that we saw. Okay, uh, and we saw all the wonderful things, supernatural things that the Holy Spirit did uh, in those days, like you know supernatural transportation uh, and other things, right? Prophecy and so many things. Okay, today we look at uh, chapter six. Uh, which is the work of the Holy Spirit throughout history, or what we can call as church history. Okay? Now, in the book of Acts, we read about the church. Again, what is the church? Is it the building? No, it is the people of God. Right? It could be a place, it could refer to a place where the people of God are gathering. Right? We, we see, okay, the church is meeting here, the church is meeting there. But church really means, the original meaning is that these are people, ecclesia, the called out ones. Okay, so the church that we see in the book of Acts is a very exciting church. Yes or no? Yeah, exciting things are happening. People are on fire for Jesus. On fire meaning, right? They will. They are willing to lay down their lives for the cause of the gospel, right? And uh, who was the first person who was martyred for the sake of the gospel? Martyred means you know he was killed for the sake of the gospel. Stephen. Right? We read about Stephen, and uh, we, we see that even those who were persecuting the church came to the saving knowledge of Christ. We read about Saul, who became Paul. Like he was persecuting, he was arresting people, but he also became a believer. Right? So we, we see all these things happening, you know, exciting things. You know, People were so on fire for Jesus that even when they were arrested, even when they were chased, Right, from one place to another, they continued to share about Jesus. That is something that we see. Right, Philip went to Samaria. We read about that in Acts chapter 7. We see that he went to Samaria, uh, or Acts chapter 8, sorry. He went to Samaria, he shared the gospel. Why did he go to Samaria? Because he was actually running away from Jerusalem, because people were persecuting. Right? So he was running away from Jerusalem, went to Samaria, he preached the gospel. So all these things we see. We see the people, the Holy Spirit directing people to go on missionary journeys. Now, where do we read that? About whom do we read that? The Holy Spirit saying, okay, I want to you know, send these people on a missionary journey. Where do we read? Huh? About whom do we read? Paul and... Paul and Silas. Ah, Silas is the second time. But the first time when you know, we see that people were praying, the Holy Spirit spoke and said, separate to me, Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas. To the work. Yeah, that's right, Gertrude. Barnabas. So separate to me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work that I have prepared for them. And then they go on that uh, missionary journey. Right. So we, we, we see that. Um, so uh, the Holy Spirit did all that. Now the church was very, you know, uh, very on fire. You know, it was, it's, it's an exciting church, and it's a church that where you and I would love to be there, right? People are uh, people are not just coming to church to uh, you know to pass the time. No, they're not coming there because they don't have any other work. It's not like that. They are coming there because they love Jesus. They are coming there at a great cost. Right? Which means that, yes, they could be persecuted for their faith. Like they could be put behind bars, behind, you know, in a prison uh, for their faith. So to call themselves a Christian or a Christ follower, it came at a great, great price or a great cost. Right? They could be chased from one place to another. Their belongings could be taken away. So it came at that price. So such was the church. Right? They did it despite great danger right and the lord you know caused the church to thrive and flourish and grow so many were you know being added to the church as we see in the book of acts okay now this church continued on for for 3 or 4 centuries we we see that 
And then what happened was when we study church history, we see that there was this king called a Roman king called Constantine, okay, Roman emperor. So he uh, he was you know attacking other nations, capturing other nations, right? So this Constantine, uh, one day he had what you know what, what he would call a vision. Okay, so he saw the cross in that vision, and he said that he thought he heard a voice which said, in this sign, you shall conquer. Okay, in this sign. Now, this sign, you, you shall conquer. Saw the cross. So he thought that this meant that, you know, in the name of, or in the, for the, uh, in, in the name of Jesus, or in the, in the, because of the cross, he would fight these battles. Okay. So he fought, he was actually, you know, uh, about to fight a battle and uh, he fought that battle and won. And because he had this experience, he had the vision, he heard the voice, he said, uh, you know, with whatever little understanding that he had, he said that now all the Romans should also become Christians. Okay. He started with his, his own soldiers, he said, all of you must you know, he didn't give them a choice. He said, you must follow Jesus. Okay. Now, uh, so everybody said, okay, we will become Christians. So he told his citizens also that, you know, you need to follow Jesus. Now, the there's nothing, um, you know, if you look at it, it seems like the good thing, right? Okay, he's telling everybody, you need to follow Jesus. But the thing is, he didn't give them a choice, right? He didn't give them a choice, you know, you... This is, he didn't say that, you know, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So, you know, it'll be good if you follow. He didn't say that. He said, you must. And since it was an order coming from the king, people obeyed. Whether they liked it or not, whether they were convinced or not, whether they really, you know, had an understanding of what salvation was, right? Uh, they, they said, okay, the king has said, now we'll call ourselves Christians. So they started, okay, what do we do? So now he said, okay, now we are going to build places of worship. I'm going to build buildings where people can gather and pray. Earlier, you know, there was a temple in Jerusalem, and then wherever people were, they were gathering, they were worshiping Jesus. Right? So now he started building. And along with that, you know, like building, he also mixed certain beliefs of Roman paganism. Okay. So some, some mixed beliefs in the sense, prayers to the saints, people who were already dead and gone. He put raised up statues, okay. So statues of um, you know Mary and Joseph, uh, and also worship of Mary. Worship of you know, Mary was never considered to be a person to uh, of deity, right? Was not ever considered to be divine. But all these beliefs started coming in. First of all, persecution stopped. Okay? So this king said, hey, no more persecution. No more, no more attacking the Christians. Now, we are all Christians. We have to become Christians. So all the soldiers, everything, army, you know, all the people. Now, people became Christians for the wrong reasons also. Right? Hey, I want to be in good books with the king. I want the king to, you know, think favorably about me. So let me become a Christian. Right? So a lot of things, these things happen. A lot of wrong beliefs came into the church. Then over a period of time, we see that the word of God also was not preached. You know, if you look at, um, if you look at the book of Acts, right? People gathered to hear the apostles teach. The apostles were busy teaching. So they gathered. They heard the apostles' doctrine and the breaking of the bread. Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3 talks about that. They gathered together, they worshiped, they prayed, they heard the teaching. And everywhere, you know, like Paul went, he established churches, he would teach. And if you see all the epistles, it is teaching, right? So there, come, there came a time where worship became more ritual. Okay, worship became more about external things. So Constantine brought in, you know, this whole thing of 
wearing special attires. You know, you should wear some robes, ceremonial robes for whenever we people you know gathered together, and the, they he he brought in this whole thing of the difference between the priests and the laity or clergy and laity, you know, those kind of things. So these he brought in all this. So people, in a way, you know, lost that fire, lost that passion for Jesus. Right? That doesn't mean that not everybody. You know, we can't say that you know everybody who can who calls himself or herself a Christian was not following Jesus. We can't say that. There were people who were truly following Jesus, but overall, the church became like this, okay? and it is what. The, uh, the historians call as the dark ages for the church. Okay, almost thousand years, 400 AD till about 1400 AD, thousand years, where the church became like this. Right, and it is very sad. If you look at the book of Acts, we see one church which is on fire, right, full of zeal. And laying down their lives, church became very lukewarm because of these wrong beliefs, like because of all these, you know, rituals, everything. And the word of God, it came to a place, right? It it became such a thing where the word of God itself was not available for the common man. Okay. Like people started writing these letters, they started putting this together, putting the word of God together. Um, but it was not available for the common man. Right. So they, uh, in the church, the, the whatever was, you know, available that day, uh, that during that time, as the, the Bible, we don't, they didn't have it as like this, right, the Bible. Whatever was there, it was actually in chained, chains. They chained it together so that the common man, just like you and I, we won't have access to it. We will not be able to read it. Okay. Now, the church and the state or the uh, political leaders, they became one. Okay. So, the, so which means the Constantine, he was looked at as a, as a religious leader. He was also the king. And whatever he said was followed both in his kingdom and in the church. So therefore, a lot of things, a lot of these wrong beliefs and all. Right? It came to such a place, it came to a time where in the church, you know, this is what they were doing. Okay? There was a lot of idol worship. They were praying for the people who were already dead. Okay? Um, and, uh, um, you know, Mary prayers towards Mary, Mary being considered divine. All those things were there. One other thing was that the priests or the ones who were leading the church, you know, they were vested with so much power. Okay, so they said, okay, we can forgive any sin. If you sin, right, we can forgive. God has authorized us to forgive you, so we can forgive. Okay. So in front of the church, they will have a list. Lying, okay, that's a sin. Now, suppose you wanted to go ahead and lie, tell a lie. Suppose you wanted to go ahead and commit a sin of adultery. Suppose you wanted to go ahead and commit a sin like murder, commit a sin like fornication, whatever. No, there was a there was a menu, just like how you go to the hotel. There'll be a menu, the price. So they had a menu card notice board with a you know with different kinds of sins and what is the price that you have to pay in order in order to get a license to commit that sin can you just imagine it was there it happened in the church right so people would say okay i have this bag of money i want to go commit adultery the priest would you know do some prayers pick the this thing and give a let give a in writing, yes, it was called an indulgence. Okay, it was called indulgences. So, which means you pay the price in order to indulge in sin, and the priest can you know, say something, do something to absolve 
uh, one of all sins. So it became like that. The church had really um, come to such a depth of losing the light of the gospel, losing the truth. Right? So the gospel was preached here and there, but not like how it was. So the historians call it the dark ages. It's something there was no light. It, it had become so dark. Um, so about a thousand years now, you know, you, if you want to do a detailed study of this, uh, we have it in our book called the Revivals, Visitations, and uh, Moves of God. Okay, there's a book uh, written by Pastor uh, compilation by Pastor Ashish called Revivals, Visitations, and Moves of God. Okay, um, maybe online students, you can just somebody can type that in. Yeah, yeah, Gertrude, do you have a question? Pastor, they use us in the Bible, no? Whatever you forgive will be forgiven and whatever you uh, retain will just be Just one second, uh, one, one minute, uh, Gertrude. I'm just getting your voice in the speaker here so that I can also hear. Yeah, go ahead. Monitor. Uh, Pastor, I'm Thank also you. from a Catholic uh, background. Yeah. But the, they say that uh, whatever you forgive will be forgiven and whatever you retain will be retained. So uh -huh. they use the priest as this is a, a permission given to them for sorry, forgiving just, sins. Just one sorry, sorry, one second. There's some technical. Oh, man. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah. Can you just uh, say something? We'll just check if you're uh, it's coming through. Pastor, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah I can hear you. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, go ahead. So you, you said you were from a Catholic church, yeah? Yeah. They say the priests, uh, like, in the Bible it says, no, whatever you retain will be retained and whatever you forgive will be forgiven. So yeah. they think that this is a permission for the priest to forgive sins. Yeah, yeah, right. I know, I know. That is That was taken, like, literally out, out of context. Of context. And used, yeah. So the, there's only one person who can forgive, and it's based on the, you know, the work of the cross, and yeah. the, what he has already carried, uh, you know, and the, the, that one perfect sacrifice, which is, which can take away the sin of the world, right? Um, so that's the thing. So it was, yeah, literally used out of context. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Pa. Brian, thanks for sharing that. Okay, so so the church has become like that. Okay, so. It was really, literally, the dark ages. It was, um, you know, it was going through such a difficult uh, time. So then, you now the reason we are studying this is because the Holy Spirit brought back or restored the truth to the church. Okay, now those thousand years, there's not nothing much happening. But here and there, there are people, pockets, you know, there are what we call as the early church fathers. The, we have these monks who are meeting and, and you know, just for the sake of um, just seeking God. So all that is happening. Uh, but from then on, like from thousand, end of 1400 AD, you know, 1500 AD onwards, we see that the Holy Spirit is bringing back, restoring back to the church the truth. Right? The truth that was that seemed to have been slipped away from the church. Right? So what, what did it? Uh, what did the Holy Spirit do? How how did He bring back? Now, one is when the church was during uh, hap happening like this, uh, it was going through this kind of a difficult, uh, you know, dark season. God gave a revelation, or Holy Spirit really raised up this person called Martin Luther. Okay, it was in Germany. Martin Luther, he was a Catholic monk, priest in the Catholic Church. So he he saw all this happening. Right? Everything was happening, and uh, for him, it it, it seemed that something is not right. right. So the teaching was: you do these good works, you go do these things, and God will forgive you, and God will. You know, you will receive salvation, forgiveness of sins. You know, you need to do all these things. Um, for him, it it didn't. Some, he said, felt something was wrong. Okay. So he was reading the book of Romans. Okay. He was reading the book of Romans. He was reading about how all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being restored 
or being saved by his grace through faith and he came to that section and then he was you know we are saved by the grace of god through faith through faith in what he has already done okay so we are not saved by doing all these things you know paying all this money doing all these rituals we are not saved by that as as was popularly preached by the priests right uh, so he came to understand hey this is this is the truth this is the word of god is reading the romans you know the book of romans and he's is coming to this place and it it says that you know, we are saved by faith uh, say save, saved uh, by grace through faith and he had a revelation and uh, said yes you know this is what it is this is the truth and we need to what what is happening here is not correct so he you know god gave him that revelation and he sat and talked he thought thought about all those things um that was going wrong and he listed down one by one okay uh, around 92 i think 92 theses right he listed it down and then he nailed it to the door of the church of that place where he was right um he nailed it to that door saying okay these are things that need to change salvation is only by this this is happening which is wrong uh, and then what is the scriptural uh, truth so he he nailed that once he did that he was arrested he was arrested by the leaders of the church okay. so they said you cannot do this and then he tried speaking he tried sharing they would not listen okay. so their fear was that they would lose political power okay so they were conquering they were waging wars these are all the religious you know the armies were actually you know just imagine whole armies being controlled by the priests or at least you know counselors or the heavily influencers heavy influencers of the armies and they were conquering nations in the name of in the name of jesus right and uh, they called it holy wars crusades right uh, so it was really sad now even today people say you know you christians you did this like you fought wars you went and you know you said you call these crusades even today people talk about that not realizing that that was nothing to do with christ nothing to do with church or nothing to do with salvation right so uh, you know the the the, Sp the spaniards it's called as spanish inquisition and they they used the symbol of the cross they used the name of jesus and uh, misapplied and misused right they would conquer nations and so on so so when when martin luther shared this truth saying that hey, salvation is by grace through faith and then all these wrong practices you know these are not in god's word this is not in god's word we need to go back to god's word we need to live our lives according to god's word right so he call it sola scriptura meaning only the word right so um there are a couple of things that um, so this is what we call as the reformation right reformation reformation of faith reformation of the church restoration of the um, of the faith okay so um let me just read a few things that uh, that came out during that time okay all the reformation um uh, this this word is latin like sola scriptura and so on so um we see that uh, there were five five statements that came out during the reformation okay or like a statement of faith okay. one was sola gratia which is grace alone what does that mean that means it's not by works right it's not by works that i'm saved it is by grace okay uh romans chapter 3 verses 10 and 12 10 to 12 right then sola fide which means faith alone so grace faith then the third one sola solus christus which means christ alone like you know all this 
was teaching to counter all the wrong teachings, wrong practices in the church. Right? So solus Christus, which means Christ alone. Then um, sola scriptura, which means scripture alone. Come back to the word of God. Right? If you're if you if you're teaching something, if you're having some practice um, in the church, some ritual, is it according to the word of God? No, if you if you're living a life in a certain way and you're saying that God you know wants me to live like this, is it there in the word of God? So he brought back this reformation movement, brought back the importance of the word of God. Otherwise, people were living their own lives. You know, all that they believed was what the priest would say. If the priest says something, ah, it must be true. The priest can say anything. Right? And like you heard about the indulgences and you know how you can commit sin and pay for it, pay a price for it, the priest can excuse you and absolve you of that sin. All that was happening because of this. You know, why people did not know the word and people were not taught the word. So here is this priest, this uh, monk, is saying, okay. We need to get back sola scriptura, right? Second uh, Peter one verse twenty one, right? Prophecy was not produced by the will of man, but men spoke as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And also scriptures like you know all scripture is God breathed, right? Second Timothy three verses sixteen seventeen all scriptures God breathed, inspired by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for doctrine, for training in righteousness, for equipping. So that the man of God might be complete. Okay, then the last one is soli dio gloria. You know all these Latin sentences. To the glory of God alone. It's not for the glory of man. It's not for the glory of the king, right? What we are doing, this church, all that is we doing. It is for the glory of God alone. So this was the reformation, what we would call as the reformation. Okay. So the Holy Spirit was raising up people like Martin Luther, raising up people, others who were there, John Hughes and, and all those um, people who brought back. So in fact, they wanted to translate the Bible in the language of the people, okay, into English, into German, right? Um, so that they, could, they, can pre they can actually print. Right? There was a man called Gutenberg in Germany who made the printing press and you know uh, who invented the printing press they wanted to print it so that it can be used by the people the, the reformation movement you know just brought in all that but they were persecuted if those who translated the bible people like wickliffe and others they were persecuted they were in fact killed why because they translated the bible i like, can you imagine like the bible that we hold in our hands it's so precious because there were people who wanted to destroy, burn the Bible, you know, completely. But nothing could stop the truth of God's word from being passed on. Okay. So, uh, you know, if you look at, if you're reading the Bible in your own, in your own language, that has come at a big cost. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sanjay, uh, for putting the link. Okay. Um, so, uh, okay, so Sunny's question is, uh, these acts of committing sin in the dark ages, uh, was it happening in Jerusalem specifically? Jerusalem also. Um, so, so the thing is that, uh, you know, all these wrong ideas or practices uh, began to be done, I mean, or it, it, it came into force because of Constantine and uh, what he brought in. He started building, you know, these, these cathedrals, these churches. Uh, he started putting in statues, uh, he started bringing in a very ritualistic um, kind of a, you know, a, uh, what, do, what do you would say, a method of worship, right? So all these were, you know, these were the wrong beliefs. So, yeah, so these, these were brought in into the church. So wherever um, this kind of beliefs were, you know, all these were happening. Um, but specifically, um, yeah, so the dark ages about indulgences also, you know, it was pretty wi widespread. Um, 
but particularly we we read about it because we i mean we read about it uh, it was there in germany because uh, we see martin luther you know uh, write out list them out and uh, yeah so it was there wherever the, the organized church was uh, these kind of beliefs were there yeah um so yeah um gertrude i, I didn't get your question um sorry what what do you want to clarify? I missed the second Reformation pastor. Second one. First oh, okay. one is Sola Grace. Yeah. Grace. So, uh, one. Sola Fide, or Fide, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, which means only faith. So only grace, only faith, uh, only the word of God, and only Christ, and only for the glory of God. So these five. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah, OK. Right. Okay, so we, we see this Reformation brought in and people are getting saved. Again, that the missionary zeal, you know, people want to share the gospel. They are people are being sent out to share the gospel. Uh, Bible is being translated into different languages, and uh, you know, people are reading the truth for themselves and they are understanding, hey, this is what the truth is, right? So that's happening everywhere, wherever the people receive the truth, that's happening globally. Okay. And then uh, 1600s onwards, let me just share the notes. I think you can follow in the notes as well. Okay. So we see that um, you know, there's more of restoration. So from 1600s, we can, we can see that there was a teaching and also people uh, you know, uh, holding on to this truth about uh, water baptism not being just a ritual but what actually it is right? so it, we call it the puritan movement the separation of church from the state right the separation of church from the state that is happening because the the state or the political leaders were using it manipulating the truth for their own benefit right so there is this whole separation because of people's understanding Right? People are now no more ignorant. They're coming to know the truth. They know this is what the truth is. So there is this separation of the church or the people of God from the uh, state or the political uh, leaders and so on. So 1600s, the Puritan movement. In the 1700s, we see what is called the holiness movement. So during the Dark Ages, there were no sense of holiness because no, there was no teaching of God's word. Right? The Bible talks about uh, the fact that in Proverbs uh, it says that my people la perish for lack of knowledge. And where there is no provision, people cast off restraints. Okay. So people perish for lack of knowledge in the sense, okay, they think, okay, this, is, this must be right. They don't know that what is right as defined by God's word, uh, they are ignorant of that, right? No knowledge of that. So people just lived as they want to live, immorality, right? all kinds of sins. Okay, so the holiness movement bringing an understanding back to the church, back to the believer. I need to live a consecrated life. I need to live a life that is sanctified. You know, I am in the world, but I cannot live as the world because Christ has called me for a different, a higher call. A higher life so my values are going to be different from that of the world so this whole thing of sanctification so we saw we see what is the holiness movement 1700s then in the 1800s we see the restoration of the divine healing movement or the power of God right this understanding of the cross this understanding that when Jesus died on the cross, he took my sin, he took my griefs and pain, he took my sickness. What we see in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 and 5. And he, he's, he bore our pain, he bore my grief on the cross, so that by his stripes I am healed. So people got a revelation of that. Hey, the cross is actually good news. John chapter 10, talking about how the Lord Jesus says, I have come that you might have life and life in its fullness. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And this whole understanding of 
the God's original design right? in Genesis, how God created man and he declares it is good. He saw creation, he declared it was good. And then came the fall and everything as an outworking of sin, right? as a consequence of sin. Man, sin brought death, sin brought everything else that was causing you know, death, spiritually, physically and so on. In fact, uh, Romans again talks about the fact that uh, you know, all mankind is under the bondage of corruption. Corruption meaning, you know, death and decay and so on. You know, nature itself is in the bondage of corruption. Okay? So then people got an understanding of that. Okay, the, the Lord Jesus, he came to heal. That was his ministry. He came to teach. He came to, you know, heal, restore people's lives. Healing for the body, healing for the mind, and so on. So, um, so then there's the whole teaching of the revelation, not only the teaching, but also the demonstration of the power of God in healing. Okay, so the holiness movement. So many names, you know, people God raised up, even in our own nation and other, uh, you know, outside um, people uh, being raised up to teach, to demonstrate the power of God, the divine healing movement. Then, you know, the 1900s. So you see, you know, these uh, thousands of years, you see the restoration of truth. What does restoration mean? Bringing back. What was lost is brought back. It was there. It is not that it, it was being newly being brought in. No. Now people think, what is this new thing? No. It was there in the early church. It was always there. That somehow people seem to have lost that revelation. So the Holy Spirit is bringing back the truth, bringing back the revelation, so the church, so the people of God, believers, can walk in that truth, experience it for themselves, right? So um, divine healing. The 1900s, a revelation of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now we need to understand that the Holy Spirit is bringing back this truth to the nations. That doesn't mean that the baptism of the Holy Spirit was not there in, you know, in places. Yeah, baptism of the Holy Spirit was there. People were being filled with the Spirit. People were getting healed, right? People were walking in holiness. It was there. But it, here, when the Holy Spirit restored this truth, it was a movement. The people caught groups of churches. People got, caught that in Revelation and say, hey, this is what the Bible says. Right? Their eyes were open to the truth and saying, this is for me. It's not for just special people. It's not for you know th those who are called to the fivefold ministry, but it is for me as a follower of Christ. It's for me as a believer, right? So this whole thing of baptism of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and so on. So 1900s, right? Um, then after that. So after that, uh, you know, from 2000 onwards, we see that uh, several restorative moves of God. Okay, one of that being the five restoration of the fivefold ministry. What is the fivefold ministry? What we read in Ephesians 4, right? Um, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, pastor, teacher, right? Restoration of the fivefold. The church beginning to recognize that, saying that yes, this needs to be there in the body of Christ. There's nothing wrong. This is what Christ actually gave as a gift to the body of Christ, right? So that people can be equipped for the work of ministry. Okay, so um, the fivefold ministry and also what we call as the equipping of the saints, right? If you see the dark ages, you know, if you were, if you were to attend the church, you go, you attend, you watch, you're a spectator, maybe you can put some offering and uh, maybe, you know, there will be some incense that is being, you know, there and all these rituals were there. You go, you as a spectator, and you come back. So these people will be there as specialized people. They are the priests and they are the ones who can forgive the sins and so on. You know? So there was this great divide. Ministry, you're not called to do. They will do it. Now, from the 2000s, we see that every believer 
is actually a minister of God. The calling might be different. The calling might be in the marketplace. The calling might be in church. The calling might be in family, whatever that, you know. But every believer in Jesus is called to minister. Okay. And that is why the fivefold ministry exists. Okay. Let's quickly look at um, just one verse, you know, Ephesians chapter 4. Let's look at Ephesians 4. And verse uh, 20. Sorry. This. Okay, Ephesians 4 and um, um, 12. Sorry. Verses 11 and 12, right? So it talks about uh, how he himself, meaning Jesus, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Verse 12, for the equipping of the saints. Who are the saints? Saints, Kone. Who are the saints? Saints means sanctified ones, consecrated ones, the followers of Jesus. You and I. Us and believers. We yeah. believers. Yes, Gertrude? We believers are the saints. Exactly. Yeah. So um, so it says, for the equipping of the saints, for what? For the work of ministry. So every saint is equipped by the fivefold ministry. Equipped for what? To do the work of ministry. So every saint, every believer is called to minister some way or the other. Right. So that understanding came into the church, you know, and we see that happening. OK, we'll stop here. Lucy, I see that question. So uh, once we come back after the break, we'll address that, right? OK, thank you.